Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today I'm going to do a video I've been wanting to do for a long time and that's going to be a um, kind of a rough buying guide for compact tractors. Um, this will be followed within a couple days by uh, a kind of an operator's guide or tips and tricks to compact tractors Focus mainly on new tractor owners because there's a a lot of useful uh, information I, I think I can pass along uh, to help folks that are new to tractors. But today we're going to talk about some of the factors that you might want to think about when you're buying a compact tractor. One thing I'm not going to focus on here today is really the brand. Um, there are some really great choices for tractor brands nowadays. Uh, you, you can't go wrong with really any of the top brands of tractors right now. Um, you know, I used to be a John Deere guy, but uh, 10, 10 years ago or so, I, I you know, took a chance on a Kubota and loved it. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of keeping an open mind about brands and, and keep your options open and, you know, look at the different brands and, and learn about them and, and uh, pick what's right for you. Um, really, the, the only thing I think that I want to interject in terms of brand is really consider your dealer, uh, how close they are to you, how they are for service and part support. Uh, how good they are to work with. That's a key important factor that you might use to pick one brand or the, uh, over the other. Um, but otherwise, you know, we're not gonna really get into brands um, um, too much today. So what, what I wanna do now is step through some of the factors I think are important in, in um, buying a compact tractor. And I got a bunch here. There's really three key ones I'll, I'll start off with and then we'll go down the list and get into some of the more subtle uh, things you wanna think about. So um, on my list, number one is gonna be horsepower, weight, and size. And that's where I think some people kind of get off course immediately when they're shopping for a tractor because you can get the same horsepower in a whole bunch of different tractor sizes and they're each gonna be able to do different amounts of work and, and it can be misleading. So I'll give you an example. Uh, this particular L-Series tractor uh, from Kubota, this is what I call a mid-size compact. Um, this is available ranging from a low of 25 horsepower up to a high of 39 horsepower. This particular one's a 32 horsepower unit. But just think about that on the low end, you could, you could get this tractor with 25 horsepower. It turns out to be a very capable tractor, but if you look at the rest of Kubota's lineup, you can also get 25 or 26 horsepower in one size down and then one size below that. So basically from subcompact to mid-compact, you can get a 25 horsepower tractor. And you might be thinking, well, you know, is the big one low on power? Is the little one overpowered? And that's where you have to start to take other things into account, like the size and the weight of the tractor and what type of traction uh, that tractor can develop. Because really, Everything about using a tractor will come down to traction, and um, that's where the weight factors in. The weight combined with the power and good traction is gonna let you get things done. And so, uh, you know, I, I know on the low end on some of the subcompact tractors, yeah, you can get those with 25, 26 horsepower engines, but they will be traction limited. And I've, I've operated some of those small tractors before. I mean, they'll spin their wheels, you know, and run out of traction long before they run out of power. And so on that low end, on the small light tractors, power is not your issue. It's always going to be traction. As you carry that horsepower up to larger tractors, though, you'll get to a point where the tractor weight catches up with the power. It gives you good traction. You're not going to be spinning your wheels. And then you'll start to be limited by power and, and not so much traction. And so when you're looking at different tractor sizes and different tractor horsepowers, just keep all that in mind. Horsepower is not everything. It's really horsepower and weight that give you the traction and give you, you the ability to do work. Uh, one other factor that goes along with that, though, is the power takeoff or the PTO. Uh, you know, you might not be doing work that is traction related you might be you know doing stationary work such as running a chipper maybe running a stump grinder running some other implement off the pto and that's one of those situations where you really might want to consider going up to a higher horsepower you know just keep in mind you'll never be able to put that power down to the ground but uh, if you need to run an implement on the pto that demands high power uh, that's going to be one of the situations where you want to 
might want to move up to higher horsepower in a given tractor size. And so um, this one again is 32 horsepower. Uh, I run a wood chipper and a stump grinder with this and it does fine. But if I was doing anything where, you know, I might be running out of PTO power, I would probably want to go up to the 39 horsepower model in this particular size just to take advantage of that capability for the PTO. It's not going to help me with ground engaging work, uh, but it would definitely help um, with the PTO. Now, number two on my list is going to be the transmission type. And for compact tractors, you're typically going to see really three types of transmissions, uh, hydrostatic or HST, a gear transmission, or a shuttle. And they all have pros and cons. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, just based on some of my usage of tractors over the past few decades, where I think each of those transmissions has their place. Uh, so first of all, the gear transmission, uh, that's gonna have a clutch, uh, fixed gears. And those tractors are really great for things like row cropping, um, mowing, ground engagement work, where you're pretty much always moving forward. Um, if you, if there's any task where you can just stick that tractor into gear and then do something for a long period of time, gear tractors are great for that. Um, one of the benefits of the gear tractor is that you're not really wasting any power between the engine and the ground. It's just a bunch of gears. Um, you know, those are very efficient for transmitting power. And so, you know, if you're doing that type of ground engagement work, um, and you don't need finesse, you don't need to be changing directions a lot. Gear tractors are great. They're gonna maximize your power and they're gonna work out great for those types of tasks. On the other end of the spectrum is the hydrostatic transmission or the HST. And that basically is a, a hydraulic uh, fluid-based trans, tr transmission where the coupling between the engine and the gear case is, is a form of a hydraulic motor. Um, and the benefits of the HST are first, very, very fine control, very good speed control, infinite gear ratios between the two extremes of the HST. Um, and, and then second, the ability to change directions very easily, very quickly. So to me, one of the applications where the HST is just perfect is if you're doing a lot of work with your front loader, going into material piles, um, you know, like, I've done that to put in driveways, to do uh, grading, uh, spreading topsoil. You know, in the course of a day, you might be going in and out of that pile hundreds of times. And the HST is just great for that. It lets you go into the, to the uh, pile with good throttle, pull a scoop, back out of the pile, dump it, come back in and, and do that over and over. And so the ability to change directions very, very quickly and easily is one of the benefits of the HST. The other though, I think is fine tune control. Um, when you move the pedals or the treadle of an HST tractor, you're basically varying the gear ratio. It's not a throttle control, and I'll get into that in uh, one of my other videos. Um, and you can, you can modulate the gear ratio of that HST from basically creep all the way up to uh, full speed for transport. And that continuously variable adjustment is one of those things really you're only going to get with an HST, and it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, for all kinds of situations. I think one of the ones where it's, uh, I notice it the most is if I'm doing rigging where I'm moving something as part of a structure, a wall, a beam into place, I can just creep right up to that very carefully with the HST. I can, you know, by, by modulating that treadle, I'm controlling the gear ratio of the tractor, the amount of torque and power that gets put down. And it's just really great for fine, fine adjustments um, where, where you have to be precise and you need a light touch. And then the final transmission is really less common than the others, and that's a shuttle transmission. Uh, shuttle is basically a gear transmission that built on top of it uh, has a gear train that gives you the ability to quickly shift between forward and reverse. And so you could put a shuttle tractor you know, in first gear or second gear and go rolling along, come through a stop and flip the lever and go into reverse very quickly uh, to back up. And in terms of uh, repetitive motions, um, shuttle's not quite as slick as an HST, 
um, but it's close. And again, it, it, one of the downsides of the HST, by the way, is because it's a hydraulic transmission, you're going to lose some power. Well, you know, a shuttle transmission is essentially a gear transmission with a quick direction change capability on it. And uh, that's also going to be very efficient with power. Um, and so uh, the shuttle to me is a really great compromise if you want a lot of the benefits of both, you know, HST. Um, I got two carpenter bees in here fighting to annoy me so you can see who can annoy me the most as they try and eat my barn. Um, but yeah, shuttle, shuttle's a great compromise. Um, you might want to look at the pricing to see, you know, how that falls compared to the other two. But if you want to do frequent direction changes with a, with a lever, it's usually a, a lever near the steering wheel. Um, a shuttle's a great choice, so that's something to consider. Shuttles are not available on all tractors. You might actually have to move up to a larger, higher end tractor to get a shuttle, but uh, if it is available on the tractor you're looking at, definitely take that uh, type of transmission into consideration. So that's number two is the transmission. Um, number three, and some people might be surprised that this is so high on the list, I'm gonna say it's your tires. Um, and that kind of goes back to this idea of power and weight and traction. Uh, you know, everything's only as good as your ability to put that traction down to the ground and also to handle the loads and the demands of the kind of work you're doing. And that's really where the tires come into play. Now there are uh, three typical types of tires you'll find on compact tractors. Uh, first one is the R1, that's an agricultural tire. And the whole purpose of that tire is forward traction, okay? So if you're gonna do any row cropping, ground engaging work, work where you need to maximize traction, uh, work in muddy conditions, not necessarily snow, but um, muddy conditions, uh, the R1 tire is probably gonna be your tire of choice. Uh, they don't have great traction in reverse, so keep that in mind, but for forward, uh, ground engaging traction, uh, the, the R1 tire is, is pretty much uh, the king. Uh, there's a turf tire, the R3 tire. The whole point of that tire is basically to go easy on, on turf. Uh, and it's got a very distributed, homogeneous type of a tread pattern. Uh, they're not great for traction in, in other types of conditions. They actually are very good in snow, by, believe it or not. but. The whole purpose of the turf tire is to minimize uh, damage when you're on soft surfaces like uh, turf. And then we come to the uh, R4, the industrial tire. That's what I have on this tractor. Really the whole point of the industrial tire is load capacity and durability. So this is the kind of tire you might find on a forklift or on a backhoe. Um, and it's really, uh, if you're going to do a lot of front loader work, if you're going to be carrying heavy loads in a three-point hitch. Uh, these are going to be the tires that will maximize your load carrying uh, ability. And then they're also um, really going to give you the most durability if you're in the woods, you know, if you're working in rocky soil. Um, these are going to be the most durable tires. And I just went down a list of uh, the typical tires that I could get for this tractor uh, if you were going to buy this from uh, the manufacturer. And uh, so the R1, the agricultural tire, that has about a 700 pound uh, capacity, um, load capacity. It has four to six plies, depending on the particular model. If you go to the turf tire, uh, those come in four ply tires, and those have about a 1,230 pound capacity. And then if you go up to the R1, uh, R4 industrial tire, that has a 1,500 pound capacity, and depending on the model you get, it's going to have anywhere between six and 10 plies. And so you can kind of get, a, get an idea as I step through that, the different load capacities, the different durabilities of the tires. Now there's a new tire on the market within the last couple of years called the R14, and that's a hybrid tire. They sometimes call that the crossover tire. And that's going to really mix the capabilities of the R1 tire in terms of traction with the R4 uh, tire in terms of durability and also the tread shape. Uh, these are really good on hard surfaces, whereas a R1 tire would not be because they're, they're, they're going to be very bumpy, very knobby feeling. But the R14 kind of mixes those capabilities. So you get a tire that can cross over from uh, soft surface traction to hard surface traction 
And so it's an interesting tire. I, I probably would consider an R14 uh, for a future tractor purchase. Um, those have a load capacity around 1200 pounds and they come with six ply. So again, it's kind of in the middle of that range, uh, but that would be an interesting tire uh, to try for sure. Um, the tires all carry different costs as really do all of these options on tractors. If you're gonna, um, uh, a lot of these tractors come stock price for the R1. If you moved up to a turf tire, you're looking at about another $150. Uh, also, if you're moving up to the R4, another $150. If you wanna try the R14 tires, well, that's another $300, probably because they're new and they're, they're novel right now. So uh, just keep that in mind, you know, the different tires, they have different purposes. Uh, they have different pros and cons. Um, I think if in, in lieu of any other factors, if you're just not sure what to get, probably the R4 or the R14 is a good middle of the road tire that can do a little bit of everything. And it will you know tend to maximize your load capacity for doing front loader work and work on the uh, three point hitch. So, um, that covers really the top three. Now I'm gonna change the camera around to, to a couple different views and we'll step through some of the other factors I think should be on your list when you're shopping for a compact tractor. All right, here we're looking at some wheels, but more importantly, I wanna talk about the drive line of the tractor and whether you might wanna consider two wheel drive or four wheel drive tractor. Um, quite a bit of, of tractor work can be done uh, on a two wheel drive tractor. In fact, you know, my tractor is four wheel drive, uh, but it probably spends, you know, 50% of its life running in two wheel drive mode. So, you know, that right there tells me a lot of work can be done with a two wheel drive tractor. And that's kind of the thing you need to play by ear, depending on your uses and applications of the tractor. But for, you know, operating uh, out in the woods in any sort of, of muddy terrain, uh, any sort of terrain with loose materials, uh, to maximize traction and work uh, performed by the tractor, you're probably going to need four-wheel drive um, in, in many circumstances, so it's, it's good to have. Um, the other important thing, and I'll get to this in a future video about tractor operation, is the way tractor brakes work, they operate on basically, uh, they, they operate internally to the transmission case. And so a two-wheel drive tractor or a four-wheel drive tractor without the front wheels engaged really only has brakes on the rear axle. And if there are any situations where you have less traction at the rear axle, um, maybe you're carrying a heavy load in your front loader and there's less weight and force pressing down on the rear tires, uh, or maybe it's just some slippery turf or you're on a hill, you might find that having brakes only on the rear axle uh, it just isn't too helpful, doesn't, doesn't help at all. And, and I know quite a few people that have had a scary situation where they stepped on the brakes, the rear wheels didn't have enough traction to do anything, and they basically had no brakes in their tractor. So one of the advantage of, of, of a four wheel drive tractor is that by engaging those front wheels, you now have brakes operating on all four wheels of the tractor, and that can improve your braking control quite a bit in hilly situations and situations with poor traction, low traction, uh, or carrying you know heavy loads um, in, in the front uh, lower of the tractor. So two wheel drive versus four wheel drive is not only about forward traction, it's really also about, about braking. And that's something you should take into account when deciding what you need for your tractor. All right, the next factor we're gonna talk about is ground clearance. And you could kind of lump that in with, you know, size of the tractor and horsepower. In fact, in most cases, you probably will. But a lot of people overlook ground clearance, uh, especially, you know, they'll hem and haw about the size of the tractor they want, and then, you know, maybe go too small and then take it out in the woods to do some logging and tear something off the bottom of the tractor, find that they're getting high centered all the time. So when you're talking about size, and weight and thinking about which uh, tractor to get. Factor in the ground clearance, look at the specs for the particular tractors you're considering. Look underneath the tractors, you know, most tractors are not protected under here. So think about, um, you know, you're gonna have to add skid plates, you're gonna have to do something to beef up the, 
the underside of the tractor if you're going to do any work in the woods. Um, and just, just eyeball that uh, because ground clearance is one of those things where if you have plenty of it, you'll never run into a problem. If you don't have enough ground clearance, you're always going to be you know, regretting it and, and running into issues. So that's the final, final thought on that, ground clearance. Okay, one of the big things I think in terms of operating a tractor is going to be the ergonomics of the operating station. And this is the kind of thing you really have to experience for yourself. So when you're shopping for a tractor, I think it's super important to be able to actually drive the tractor you're going to buy, compare all the different brands, the different models. Uh, you really will, will find that some of them fit you better than others. Some are more comfortable to use. And so you want to look at the, the comfort of the operator station. Uh, the pedals, the controls, you know, controls for your rear remotes and three-point hitch, controls for the front loader, and just everything else. Uh, you know, make sure the tractor is a good fit for you. Everything is in a logical place. It's it's something that makes sense. Uh, some of the tractors that I've written off, you know, were because I, I sat in the tractor and, and started working the controls, and, and it was like there was no cohesive... Um, design approach to the controls they were just terrible um, you might want to play around with the front front loader uh, stick get an idea you know the feel and the precision in that front loader they're not all created equal uh, I've kind of rejected uh, several tractors because the front loader controls were just too jerky um, and so that's the kind of thing you really need to try out for yourself in person uh, but make sure you definitely take that into account all right, here's another thing to consider, and that's access onto the operating platform of the tractor. You know, you want to look and see, does this tractor, if it's a high ground clearance tractor, does it have a step? Does it have grab handles on both sides that let me get into that uh, station? Um, you know, what's the floor like? Is it a flat floor? Does it have a tunnel? Um, how easy is it to, you know, get on and off this tractor? And if you're like me and you got big feet and you're, getting on and off with work boots, hey, can you even, you know, fit fit your work boots um, in through there to, to get on and off the tractor comfortably? So those are things that uh, you definitely want to take into account. Along with uh, the operator station ergonomics, you really should put a lot of emphasis on the type of seat that comes on the tractor, not just the seat, but also its suspension. And that's another thing where I immediately took tractors off my list because they maybe did not have a suspension seat uh, or the seat was just really basic and crude, you know, uh, with just springs on it. Uh, if you're going to spend any amount of time operating the tractor, and, and in my case, you know, I might spend eight hours on a tractor in, in the middle of some projects, uh, you really want to have a good seat. Um, this is something you can sometimes upgrade in the aftermarket, but believe believe me, those good suspension seats are big, big dollars. Uh, you'll be you'll be ahead, uh, you know, financially if you can pick a tractor that comes with a good seat from the factory. And so, you know, make sure you're comfortable on that seat. Make sure it has a suspension. Um, make sure it has an adjustable suspension because we we all have different sizes and weights. Uh, you know, I have to crank up the suspension on this seat a little bit uh, compared to when other folks use it just because I'm heavier. Um, but that suspension is really, really critical to absorbing and, and damping out bumps and, and jiggles and, and things that you're going to experience for hours at a time when you're operating this tractor. So if you try a tractor and it really just has a basic rigid mounted seat or a, only springs, you know, I, I think you can do better and uh, definitely take that account into account. Try and get a, a tractor with a full suspension seat if you can. Now, if you get a HST tractor, you might want to spend some time looking at all the different types of controls that the different manufacturers offer. You're really gonna find basically two types of, of controls for an HST. Uh, like what I have, a, have here on this Kubota, this is a treadle. So you've got forward and reverse uh, attached to a common um, actuator that's under the floor um, and that actu Kubota actually has two two well two or three versions of a treadle believe it or not um, one of them you're meant to put your foot on and operate like a big rocker uh, there are other ones that have two distinct pedals poking through front and back that you'll um, actuate with your heel or your toe and then this particular one 
Um, it's a common uh, one-piece treadle, but to operate this, you actually shift um, your, your foot back and forth uh, to, to actuate this heel and toe. And so there's even different types of, of treadles that you might want to consider. Some will be more comfortable than others. Uh, John Deere and many other brands use a two-pedal setup. So you have one pedal for forward, one pedal for reverse. And uh, people, people tend to be very um, loyal to one setup or another. Now I have a Deere and I have a Kubota. Sometimes I use both tractors back to back in the same day. Both work for me. Uh, I don't really have any problems switching back and forth between them. Um, really the problem I has, have is if I'm operating uh, an HST tractor all day long and then I go hop in my truck, um, I tend to be looking for a reverse pedal on the truck, and of course they don't have them. So uh, uh, you, you spend some time looking at the types of treadles and pedal arrangements if you're going with HST. Make sure they're comfortable for you to use. Make sure it's something you think you can use for you know, hours at a time. If you have any knee problems or leg problems or you know, other handicaps or anything like that, this could be very important. And so you, it's the kind of thing you want to take into account uh, as you down select to a certain brand and, and model of HST track. Okay, so I got the hood open. Uh, uh, talk about a few things over here. Uh, first one is the motor. And if you get a Kubota, they make their own motor. So there's not a lot to research there, but many of the other tractor brands will use a motor uh, from a different manufacturer. And so when you're looking at a particular tractor, you know, open the hood, look at the motor, ask questions, figure out who makes that motor, and then consider the implications when it comes to parts and support and maintenance. And, and also, you know, look at that engine. Is that something you can work on? Can you get in there? Is it easy to get to the different filters and the other consumable items? Uh, so if you do plan to maintain the tractor by yourself, you know, make sure it's uh, an engine that you can work on and one that you can get parts for. Um, and particularly when it comes to maintenance, you know, you might want to consider, okay, well, do I have a dealer right down the street I can go to to get parts and consumables? Uh, is this stuff I can order online easily? Sometimes you can get the stuff on Amazon. So, you know, all that's going to come down to who makes that motor and how easy it is to work on. And so uh, definitely take that into account. Okay, so the other thing you want to think about in terms of the engine is the emissions and the emissions equipment on the engine. Now this particular tractor was a 2014 model. Uh, back then we were under tier four interim um, regulations for, for diesel emissions. And this tractor was able to meet those regulations without any special equipment. So this is a very simple engine. It doesn't have a computer, it doesn't have any emissions control on it. But a few years after I bought this tractor, tier four final regulations went into effect and they impose much stricter standards that uh, tractor engines have to meet. Now under 26 horsepower um, those tractors pretty much carry forward the tier four interim technology and, and they won't have any emissions equipment on them they'll tend to be simpler uh, motors. Above 26 horsepower um, you're going to tend to be finding some fairly complex emission systems uh, strapped onto the engine uh, in, in order to meet those uh, uh, regulations. And, um, you know, we've had enough years of, of experience with those systems now to know that some of them work fine, uh, some of them have been a pain in the butt, some of them have had really bad problems. And so if you're getting a tractor uh, uh, above 26 horsepower, you really want to research that carefully, you know, look Talk to other people, look on the internet for experiences with the emission system on that particular tractor, and make sure that it's going to be something you can live with. There's a couple different types of uh, emission systems um, in typical use today. Um, I think one of the probably the most common one is to put a diesel particulate filter downstream of the engine, and that's a filter that's going to catch the soot and the particulates in that diesel exhaust and uh, let them build up on, on a type of a screen uh, and a chamber inside of that uh, uh, filter, or we call it a DPF. And then at certain intervals, based on the use of the tractor, it could be 20 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours, somewhere in that range, the tractor is going to need to do what's called a regen, where it runs at a higher engine speed and introduces heat into that DPF to burn off all those particles that were captured in there and release them 
uh, down, you know, onto the ground is basically harmless soot um, instead of what otherwise would have gone up into the atmosphere. And um, those regens can be an issue. Um, there are different strategies for carrying out regens, and that's the kind of thing you want to research. Um, when, when the, when, uh, and by the way, the, the, the computer on that, that engine is going to be measuring pressure across that particulate filter. And when it detects enough of a back pressure, it's going to say, hey, this thing's full. I need to do a regen. And sometimes you as the operator can defer that. So if you're doing something and you don't want to do a regen right then, you can you know, push a button and it might give you, you know, 10 more hours of operation. Um, some of the regens have to happen right then. Some regens can uh, be done while you're operating the tractor, in which case you might not notice much difference. It might run hotter and it might smell a little different and it might be at running at higher revs, but otherwise you'll still be able to operate the tractor. Other tractors require a parked regen. Some of the tractors might be able to do both or require one in one situation and let, you know, do another in a different situation. So that's the kind of thing you want to thoroughly research to make sure that the regen scheduling and behavior on that particular engine is going to be something you can live with. Um, you know, I'm thinking of some of the scenarios where I use the tractor. Um, it would be awful inconvenient if I had to park the tractor and let it do a regen for 20 minutes. Um, and so, um, you know, research that thoroughly and make sure that, you know, you're okay with the, the, the type of emissions equipment on the tractor and any type of of regen schedules and, and procedures that the tractor has to carry out. And the final thing I want to mention is that you kind of have to be careful. Um, the, the tractor companies have taken to marketing to try and, you know, get you to think that their systems might be better than, than the competitors. The bottom line is that there is no free lunch with this emissions uh, stuff and these regulations. You, they, the tractors have to meet these regulations. Um, uh, Mahindra has a new system called MCRD where they don't have a DPF and so one of their big things in marketing now is hey you know you don't have to sit through regens well that MCRD system has its own downsides it, it tends to operate hotter all the time it probably uses more fuel all the time because it's running the engine hotter to burn off that soot uh, in operation so when you're researching this just try and cut through the marketing baloney there's no free lunch for any of these systems and just you know, try and understand how they work and make sure they're going to be uh, something that you can live with while you own that tractor. Okay, finally, while we got the hood open, I want to talk about the body material on tractors. And you're basically going to find two options in, on most modern tractors. It's either going to be a plastic or a composite type of a panel or a metal panel. Um, I've owned both tractors over the years. Uh, I've, I've got a deer in the barn behind me that has a plastic body. Uh, this Kubota, my previous Kubota, have uh, metal bodies. And then uh, before that, I had a deer with a plastic body. And they both have pros and cons. Uh, I think the biggest benefit to the plastic bodies is that you don't have to worry about rust at all. And so, you know, depending on your climate, depending on where you store your tractor, uh, depending on how you operate your tractor, those plastic body panels may be very compelling you know, thing for you and, and you might really want to get a plastic uh, uh, body tractor. Um, the one of the downsides of the plastic well so so in addition to the ability that it you know doesn't rust uh, the plastic has a pretty good amount of impact resistance but it's up to a point and so the the older deer that I had I had a situation where a log fell out of the front bucket when I was uh, dumping a load and it cracked uh, the corner of that plastic hood and it cracked it in a way that I could not fix it. It basically shattered into a lot of small pieces and left some really sharp jagged edges to the point where I felt it was unsafe. And I had no option but to buy a new hood for that tractor and it was pretty expensive. I think it was about $900, you know, back maybe 20 years ago. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the downsides of the plastic, I think it's impact resistant up to a point, but if you pass that point, you know, chances are it's not something you're gonna be able to fix. Um, easily. Um, this particular tractor you probably can't see but there's a dent on the front of this hood from a similar type of situation. I had a log fall out of the loader and, and put a dent up there. Um, you know 
Worst case scenario, you can always bang out a dent or you can even you know, cut the metal out and weld in a new piece. So I sort of feel like the metal is more repairable than the plastic. Um, and, and so again, there's pros and cons to both. You kind of have to weigh uh, both materials and think about what's most important to you when deciding uh, what's going to be the best choice. All right, so a lot of people, when they buy a compact tractor, one of the main reasons they're buying that tractor is to get the utility of a front loader, uh, either for bucket work or maybe with uh, forks, uh, like I show here. And so um, it's really important to make sure you're getting a good loader and that you understand the specs of that loader. Um, a company like Kubota, they make their own loaders, um, but some companies do not. Uh, they'll generally have a third-party loader. Some cases they integrate that loader very well and it's really a nice loader. Other cases they don't. And so that's the kind of thing you want to pay attention to when you're buying a tractor. Find out who makes the loader and get a feel for how well it's built, what the quality is, and then how well it's integrated with the tractor. Uh, you know, is it a good fit? Is it removable? Um, is, it, is it made well? And then in particular, pay attention to the loader controls. Um, there are different classes of valves and controls for loaders. On a good tractor, um, you can develop a lot of proficiency and a lot of finesse with a front loader to the point where once you get operating it for a couple hours, it's, it's almost transparent. It's like you're part of the machine, you know, and, and you can get really good with a front loader. Um, but other tractors might have really jerky valves or poor controls, and you're never really going to get into that zone where you become a pro at operating that loader. And these are the kind of things you can feel out during a demo. So uh, if you're driving a tractor around on a dealer lot, you know, work the loader controls, get an idea how much fine adjustment there is, how much finesse there is in those controls. If it's jerky, if it doesn't let you, um, you know, put, put a good level of control into what you're doing, you know, that's a, that's a clue that that's probably not the best loader out there. And then the other area, um, you want to think about is the design of the loader, uh, lubrication points, the grease fittings, because these need to be lubricated about every 10 hours. And so uh, once you start going through that experience, you're going to find that, you know, how it's designed, where the grease fittings are, what kind of pins are used, uh, that, that will kind of come into play into your daily operational procedure. So take a look at all that stuff too. Um, finally, look at the hose routing. You know, does it look clean? Does it look well integrated? Are the hoses protected? Um, that's, that's good. Those are all good things. You might see one loader that's got the hoses hanging off below the tractor or sticking out the side. You know, that's poor integration. That's the kind of thing you might want to avoid. And then, uh, last but not least, you know, carefully look at the specs for the loader. And this is where I think a lot of people get trapped. There's not really a universal standard for giving you loader specs. So you might see a single published number like max capacity of the loader, but what one manufacturer tells you might not be apples to apples consistent with what another manufacturer tells you. And so you kind of want to suss that out and make sure you're comparing things on an even level. Um, up in the corner of the screen here, somewhere I'm going to overlay uh, the loader lift curve for this particular tractor. And the first thing you'll notice when you look at that curve is that the loader lift capacity varies with height. There's no single number that describes the performance of a loader, and that's true of all the loaders. Uh, basically, they have their max capacity down on the ground level, uh, and then the higher you lift the loader, the further the goes up and further it reaches out, the lower the capacity is going to be. And that's just the reality of the mechanical linkages and the hydraulics of these types of systems. Uh, as a result of that, you kind of want to make sure you're comparing different brands and different models of loaders at some common height. And unfortunately, that's not easy because some tractors lift higher than others. Um, I remember when I was shopping most recently for this, uh, six, eight, eight years ago, I guess, um, there was one brand, I think it was LS. They had, they tended to have really short, stubby loader arms and they had really great capacities. Uh, then you'd look at Kubota or Deere and they have much longer loader arms that give you higher lift and reach and they have lower capacities. And so if you only look at that capacity number, you might think LS has a much stronger loader, but the fact is their loader doesn't lift as high. 
uh, on the ones I was looking at at least. And so of course it's gonna have a stronger number, it's not going as high. So just to give you an idea of the variability that we saw in that chart for this loader, if you were to lift this loader to maximum height, uh, the capacity all the way up is gonna be 1,100 pounds, which does not sound like a lot, but down on the ground, the capacity is 2,700 pounds, more than double. And so you wanna factor all that stuff in when you're looking at tractors and comparing loaders, you know, what's the rating down low? What's the rating up high? Where am I going to be using this loader the most? What matters to me? Is it, is it capacity down low? Is it reach to get, maybe lift the beam up on my sawmill shed? Um, uh, is it vertical reach? Is it horizontal reach? I mean, some loaders go out further than others. So take all those things into account. Don't just get stuck on a single uh, capacity rating at some height. Try and put things on an even keel and, com and compare things, uh, you know, Look at the curves if you can. Uh, the, the curve I showed was from the owner's manual. Well, a lot of tractors, you can look at the owner's manual online uh, for that loader that's gonna be on the tractor you're considering. That'll give you a chance to look at the curve and you know make your own conclusions as far as lift capacity versus height. And you know make sure that's gonna work for your purposes. All right, so here we're looking at the PTO or power takeoff lever uh, on my particular tractor. This is something you want to get uh, details on uh, uh, when you're looking at tractors because there's different types of PTOs. There's an old school live style PTO that actually ties that PTO into the drive line of the tractor. So uh, forward motion of the tractor and the PTO are basically connected to each other. Uh, there are more modern independent type of PTOs that separate the two. And both of those have implications for usage with different types of implements. So that's something you're gonna to wanna to figure out and make sure you're getting uh, the right kind of PTO for your uses and, and something that's gonna be safe uh, for you, especially if you're doing stuff like mowing or tilling or you know anything where you're combining a forward motion of the tractor with operation of that PTO. And then one, one last point about PTOs, some tractors only come with a rear PTO uh, some tractors come with both rear and mid PTOs. Uh, mid PTO would tend to be facing forward and could be used to drive things like a snow blower or a uh, under-mounted uh, mid-mount mower. Um, depending on the uses you envision for your tractor, you know, you might want one of those mid PTOs. For other folks, uh, you know, they only, uh, only need a rear PTO and, and so uh, that's something you, you want to plan for when you're shopping around for tractors. All right, here's something pretty simple that you might want to take into consideration, and that is the location of the fuel filler port. Now, some tractors will put this in a pretty convenient location, like on a fender or in a saddle-type location down on the side of the tractor, and those are really easy to get to. Uh, this particular Kubota has it up uh, on, on the hood, and... Uh, yeah, I tend to use a transfer pump with a hose, so it kind of doesn't matter to me. I just point that hose wherever the fill port is in a tractor. But if you're having to lift, you know, five gallon cans of diesel up, uh, it's definitely harder to do when the filler port is up on the hood. So if you're going to be fueling a tractor that way, you know, you might want to look for a tractor that has more convenient access uh, to, to fuel up. All right, so here we are at the back of the tractor, and this is probably an area that a lot of people overlook, but there are a lot of things back here that you wanna take into consideration. Um, the first thing I would look at uh, is the quality and the construction of the three-point hitch linkages and components and the turnbuckles and the adjustments. And this is where you can see a wide range of stuff on different tractors. I've seen stuff that looks just really chintzy and, and junky you know, like it came out of a hardware store. Uh, and then I've seen components that are really, really heavy, well-built, powder-coated or painted or whatever in, in good shape. And so, you know, just take a look at the turnbuckles and the linkages and the various pins that they're supplying to you. You know, make sure it's good quality stuff. You don't want junk back here because this three-point hitch uh, really does a lot of work. The other thing to look for is the type of draw bar that, uh, comes with the tractor. Some tractors include a draw bar, some don't. You might have to pay extra for a draw bar and some. Um, just check the draw bar out, make sure you know it's gonna work for your needs. You might wanna put a trailer ball on there. 
Uh, generally, it's not great to tow trailers with a tractor on the drawbar because it's so far in. You know, that's 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 a really a bad turn uh, pivot point for a, a trailer ball. But uh, you can get extensions for the drawbars. You might want to put a clevis hook on, like I've got here. So, you know, look at the utility to the drawbar and whether it's going to work for you. And then the last thing, and a lot of people don't consider this until after they've had a, cat a catastrophic failure. Uh, look at the construction of the rear gear case of the tractor. That's often what the three-point hitch attaches to and the axles attached to. And then, of course, you know, tractors bolt together uh, uh, engine transmission through, through uh, uh, that really forms the backbone of the tractor is all that bolts together. So look at the construction of that rear case. You know, is it made out of steel? Is it really heavy, a cast iron, a good gear case, or is it lightweight aluminum? Some tractor brands will use aluminum back there. Um, over the years, I've, I've learned about quite a few failures of these rear cases when, when someone does something, uh, you know, bad with their tractor, either overloading the three-point hitch or sh putting some sort of a shock or impact load into the three-point hitch, which breaks off part of the case, or some issue with, you know, uh, overloading the 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 tractor or the, the wheels and, and tearing an axle apart. And uh, a lot of that comes down to how well this rear case is constructed. So uh, take a look at that as well. All right, uh, quite a few people are gonna want uh, rear remotes on their tractor. These are basically auxiliary hydraulic circuits that can be connected to different types of valves and you can use them to actuate different types of things. Uh, I've got uh, one hooked up now to actuate a hydraulic top link. Um, I've got a second pair not in use that could uh, run a hydraulic side link. Um, some tractors come with rear remotes. On some tractors, it's optional. So you want to look into that. You want to look into the pricing. And, and really most important to me is look at the integration of the rear remotes, where the outlets are, where the hoses route to. Um, some of these can look like a really wild contraptions and, you know, I am like, I have no idea how a manufacturer could have designed that. Maybe they subbed it out to a contractor who just slapped on generic parts, but I've seen some rear remote setups that are just downright ugly and just obnoxious sticking out hoses everywhere, really hard to use. So take all that into account, make sure you got a decent uh, rear remote setup on the tractor if that's something you need for your usage and then also look at the integration of the rear remote valves uh, those are the uh, two valves uh, to control my outlets so this tractor can take up to three I only put two on there one is a standard dual action valve the other is a float uh, detent valve and so you want to look at the integration of these is it something that's easy to operate is it something that's tucked in out of the way this is another place i've seen some real contraptions where it looks like you know someone has mounted a I know, like a robot with levers up on the fender of their tractor with levers sticking out and uh, you know it's like I, I yeah i guess it works but it's not well integrated and it's it's awkward to use and so you know, look at how that manufacturer has integrated those remotes, uh, or if it comes as a kit, you know, is it something you can put on yourself and end up with a fairly well integrated product? All right, so pretty much every tractor you're going to buy on the market today is going to come with one of these, a ROPS, a rollover protection system. And this is something you might want to look into uh, when you're, you're comparing different tractors to, to, to determine, first of all, what the height of the ROPS is, does it fold? Can it fold into different positions? How easy is it to fold it down and put it back up um, and use it? Because, you know, tractors are very dangerous. Rollovers can happen in an instant. Uh, this, this can really protect you in, in the event of a rollover, but it's only going to work if it's up and locked into position. So you want to find a ROP system that's easy to use, easy to put up, and is going to be something that you'll take advantage of. Um, the other factor, of course, and this, this happens, I can't tell you how many times I've heard a story of somebody who gets a brand new tractor, they're driving around having a great time, and at the end of the day, they go to park it in the garage and they, you know, run into the header of the, the garage door opening or tear the garage door off the tracks or something crazy because they didn't think about it and they just drove in with the ROPS all the way up. And so when you're looking at different tractors, you know, 
measure the height of the ROPS, compare it to where you want to park the tractor. Uh, if it's going to be a situation where you have to put the ROPS down to get in and out of that, uh, that location, you know, it'll make sense to have a ROPS that, that can fold down easily and go back up easily, again, to promote uh, usage of, of the ROPS. So ROPS are good to have, but, you know, check on the specs, make sure it's going to work for your situation. Okay, I want to wrap up this video um, uh, really talking about one final thing. And I mentioned up front, I wasn't really going to get into brands. There's so many good tractors on the market today. We have great choices and I don't think you can go wrong with any of them. Um, you will find, you know, as you're shopping, some are a little bit better than others. Some have better reputation. Uh, some have better quality, better fit and finish, better controls. That's to be expected. And so I would encourage you to take your time and really enjoy the shopping experience, demo the tractors, drive them. Um, and uh, th that'll answer so many questions. You'll start to feel, you know, as you go along, hey, I, this tractor really is, is better for me. I like it better. And uh, I, I'd say try and look at at least three or four brands and, and help you hone in on uh, what's gonna be the best tractor for you. Uh, definitely consider the dealer um, and the brand in terms of support that they can provide to you as a customer uh, for parts, for service. Um, those are things that uh, you, you, you sometimes you can't measure with specifications, but those could be very important to your ownership experience uh, with the tractor. And then the last point I wanna leave you with is one thing you don't wanna do when you're shopping for a tractor is let price really drive your decisions at least not to you know maybe you can use it to as a tiebreaker but uh definitely don't go into tractor shopping just looking for the least expensive tractor that is a sure way probably to find the you know one of the worst options out there now there are different brands you know you've got deer and kubota uh they tend to be the market leaders here in the united states i think kubota is right around 50 percent market share they're they're huge uh, deer's, deer's a little bit smaller in the compact space, by the way, this, this size tractor. Um, and they have a pretty good reputation, but there are some upstart companies from Korea, South Korea, and other parts of the world that are making really great tractors. Um, every bit as good as Kubota and Deer. And chances are you can get one of those tractors and save money. So if you shop around and you look at all the brands and you end up with one of the Korean brands and you're like, hey, you know, this tractor's as good as the others, maybe it's better than the others, and I'm saving $4,000, that's great. You can't do better than that. But don't go into it only shopping on price. Um, I, would, I would definitely leave the price consideration to be one of the final steps in, in choosing a tractor. I think that by, by taking price out of the equation early on, it's going to let you focus on features, on support, um, on the quality of the tractor, on the controls, on how well it fits you, how comfortable it is to operate. And, uh, you know, all those things that are going to matter for your long term ownership experience actually using the tractor. Um, and I'll tell you this, I mean, I've had tractors for, my gosh, 20, 25 years now. Um, any little issue with cost or price at the beginning when you're shopping, you know, a couple years in, it's gone. You're not gonna even care about it. You, what you'll care about is how well the tractor works for you. And uh, every tractor I've owned, you know, within months of owning it, I felt like I was getting my money's worth um, immediately. I mean, they were good values. They were, you know, really helpful around the property. And so, um, you know, a few years in, I don't even remember what the price was. I don't even care what the price was. I just can look back and say, yeah, you know, I shopped a bunch of tractors and uh, I picked a great tractor and I've been happy with it and I'm, you know, going to keep it for a long time. So don't let price come into play early. Use that towards the end if you need it uh, as a tiebreaker. Uh, chances are you're going to find a great tractor that you'll be uh, happy with and excited to buy, uh, irrespective of the price. If it happens to be one of the brands that saves you money, hey, that's even better because we all like to save money. So anyways, I hope this video has been useful. 
Uh, next video coming up in this series is going to be uh, tractor operating tips and tricks uh, for, for new owners because there's a lot to cover there. And uh, I think that'll be a good video. But uh, that's going to do it for today. Uh, as always, if you have questions or comments, please leave them below. Uh, I'd love to see that kind of feedback. If you have suggestions for other videos or some things that maybe I didn't talk about in this video, uh, please mention that as well. Um, otherwise, thanks for watching. See you next time.